What's up nerds and welcome to this brief guide to slaying the spire. My name's Ina Beta. I'm an avid player who's beaten the game on the hardest difficulty many times over and I regularly stream runs with the nerd squad, my community on Twitch. At the time this video was made, I've logged over 1100 hours in the game and during that time viewers have asked me over and over to dive into what I think are the most important aspects to becoming a better player and conquering the spire. Whether you're brand new to Slay the Spire or have some hours in the game already, our hope is that these tips and strategies will empower you to take the leap and try the game yourself or simply improve on what you already know. And before we jump in, I'm excited to announce we're doing a giveaway to celebrate our first Slay the Spire guide. All you have to do to enter is make sure you're subscribed to the channel and let us know down in the comments what's your favorite class and why. If you're new to the game, just say which class looks the most interesting. We'll randomly choose one lucky winner from the comments and send them this awesome Spire Slayers pin set from the Fangamer merch store. The winner will be chosen on December 20th, 2020, and all they have to do to collect the prize is connect with me over Discord for shipping info. And without further ado, here are 10 things I wish I knew when I first tried to slay the Spire. Number 1. It all depends. I want to kick things off by shattering a common misconception and hammering home a very important point about Slay the Spire. Everything in this game is situational. Our brains are designed to seek out patterns and commonalities, and we're often trained to look for the best things in video games. I think we jump into the Spire and wonder the same things. What's the best class? What are the best cards, the best relics, the easiest bosses, so on and so forth. In fact, I get these questions live on stream all the time, and I always answer with, well, it depends. And I urge you to keep that in mind throughout the rest of this entire guide. While it's possible to draw some commonalities and rules of thumb, I would argue that there are no best, easiest, most powerfuls, or anything like that. Simply put, this game is about understanding your current situation and adapting to it. Embrace that crisis of choice, as options are always changing throughout your run, and you're constantly forced to make decisions based on current factors, such as available pathing, current HP, the class you're playing, at least you've already fought, at least you want to fight down the line, the boss that awaits you at the end of the act, not to mention every card, relic, and event you're presented with as you ascend the spire. Instead, I'd recommend you focus on other, more productive lines of thinking, like what kind of synergy exists in my current cards and relics, or what do I need to survive elite fights in this act? The answers to these questions, and more importantly, learning to find the quickest and best answers to them, is going to serve you a lot better and shape you into a hardened Spire Slayer. Number 2. Considering Different Paths Now that we've touched on the importance of adaptation and decision making, let's apply that to pathing. Slay the Spire is like a dungeon crawler in a lot of ways, and the path you choose all depends on a variety of factors that you have to constantly evaluate as you work your way through. Here are some basic rules of thumb that I wish I thought about when I first started out. As you begin Act 1, try to find a path that includes exactly three normal fights and preferably a rest site for a spicy upgrade before the first elite you plan to fight. Ideally, your path should have at least two elites, and the later in the act these elites are, the better, as you'll have more time to build your deck and prepare for them. Additionally, if one of these paths includes an empowered elite if you're going for the heart kill, or has an option for a third elite fight, that's a definite bonus. Preferably, you want a rest site before each elite in order to heal if needed and for a valuable card upgrade if not. Now, shops in Act 1 can be rather underwhelming due to our early lack of gold, so try to find one as late in the act as possible. That said, if there are one or more elites on your chosen path that are early and there's a store before them, consider going to that store and picking up a potion or two to get you through those fights more safely. After these considerations, try to have a good mix of normal fights and unknown floors for more gold, card rewards, and hopefully some beneficial events. Now, Act 2 and 3 path evaluations are much more situational and depend greatly on many factors like the deck you built through the previous act, the boss relic you just picked up, and the amount of money you have, to name a few, so it's really hard to provide a quick, general rule for pathing in those acts. But applying this strong, general strategy for Act 1 should help ensure you see a later act more often. Okay, we did it. You did it. That wasn't me, you did it. Number three, embrace elite fights. When you're starting out in Slay the Spire, it can be really tempting to avoid elite fights, which are represented by the skull markers all on the map. After all, they tend to be more difficult, and this game's already plenty challenging, right? 
While this evaluation seems to make sense, there are some really important reasons why you shouldn't skip over elite fights and why doing so actually hurts you in the long run. First of all, elites are probably your best source of relics throughout a run, and relics gained from elites are almost always going to do something beneficial for your run in some way. Also, compared to many normal fights, elites are more predictable in both the pool you can choose from, it's literally the same three fights each act, and the AI within the fight. While normal enemies get more difficult as you go through the act, especially after those first few, elite fights always remain the same difficulty. Some other less important reasons to fight elites include they drop an increased amount of gold compared to normal fights, you need to fight at least one elite, the empowered one, to get to act four in the heart, Elites make for perfect snipe targets too, meaning should you start your run with Niao's Lament and make the enemies in the next three fights only have one HP, you're literally one-shotting elites whose rooms are close to the beginning. I plan to cover these and other points in more depth in a different video, but the bottom line is that elites are more predictable, profitable, and present a challenge worthy enough to help you feel out the power of your deck moving forward. So start building regular elite fights into your runs as soon as possible. If you're not building towards killing elites, there's little chance you're making it to the top. Number four, do not take every card. Now that we've hit on general strategy and pathing, let's focus on deck building for a bit. As a new slayer, it's confusing and counterintuitive to not take cards. After all, you're not even really sure what those cards do yet and what they synergize with. But one very important thing you're going to see many skilled players doing is clicking the skip button on card reward screens. Experimentation is highly encouraged, but generally keeping your deck slim and synergistic is important as you build it. I just don't feel like this is a deck that want to add, wants to add cards to it. Meh, I don't want those. After all, success depends on you drawing the cards you want to see and not bloating your deck with cards that don't synergize. Frequently stop and take a moment to consider what your deck does well. You can always click on the deck icon here. Ask yourself, what does my deck do well right now? What is my deck missing? What synergies can I build into? Do the cards on the screen help me solve a challenge coming up? If you're presented with a card reward and can't pretty quickly see how it adds value to what your deck already does, or it isn't a card that helps you get through an elite or a boss coming up, then you probably shouldn't be taking it. Take less cards in your future runs, and watch your decks get slimmer, trimmer, and more consistent. Number 5. Simplify Your Deck in addition to our previous point, another option that generally eludes new players is the power of card removal. Whenever you come across a shop or a specific event, you're presented with the option to remove a card from your deck. Now, we establish you don't want to take any old card, so it should be equally obvious we also want to be utilizing card removal to strengthen the overall performance and synergy of the deck we built. Generally, a perfect target for card removal are things like curses, which are only penalties to your deck. However, it's just as important to remove things like strikes, block, and other trash which simply aren't empowering your deck anymore and are robbing you of a chance to draw more useful cards during fights. Again, every run's situational. Sometimes the deck may not mind curses too much, for example. But overall, the goal is to build decks full of impactful cards that you can draw and play consistently, and removing cards helps you do just that. It's being able to get to like all these things that we want to see more often. You know, to more reliably set up things like this with darkness, I think is going to allow the uh, damage output to be where it needs to be to get past the Hexaghost. Number six, get that card draw. If in fact our goal as effective slayers is to build decks full of impactful cards we draw and play them consistently, then we need to be drawing them. An often neglected aspect of many decks are cards that help you draw other cards. I find this to be true for players new to card and deck building games in general, as it feels like playing a card which gets you another card is wasteful or slow. In fact, the opposite is true and the importance of having cards that draw more cards cannot be overstated. Think of it this way. Even if you don't have the energy to play all the cards you draw, the fact that you draw past weaker cards makes it more likely you're going to draw into strong and impactful cards you've added or will add to your deck, which is extremely valuable. Card draw is one of the main reasons why the ever-popular Sneko Eye is as popular as it is, and is likely why it has the much higher win rate it does compared to other popular relics. With card draw being this important, the fact that Sneko Eye provides you an extra two card draw at the start of every turn for the rest of the run is simply nuts. That's like playing a draw card every turn, except you don't need to draw or play that card, and it costs you no energy. Now this does not mean you should click Sneko whenever you see it, but if you have a deck that can handle the cost of its cards being randomized, 
then you have an extremely powerful relic on your hands. So if you find your decks having trouble drawing to those important powers or other impactful cards consistently, slim that deck down and add more draw to that deck. Number 7. Choose the right upgrades and relics. Upgrading cards is an obvious way to increase your power over the course of the game, and while almost any upgrade is good for your deck, they are not equally valuable. For instance, Reaper and Claw are two pretty popular cards, but upgrading to one additional damage on Reaper and two additional damage on Claw is pretty unimpressive. On the other hand, a card like Catalyst loves an upgrade. Going from doubling the current poison on a target to tripling the current poison takes that rather slow poison build and makes it extremely bursty. There's a few different ways to acquire these valuable upgrades during a playthrough, but the majority are going to happen at rest sites. Generally, if you build a decent deck and you play it well during fights, you should be able to get away with clicking that smith option more often than not, and scaling your deck's power all the way up the spire. Relics can also scale your build's efficacy across a run, but have different considerations. Like we discussed earlier, most of the relics you're going to get are presented to you after an elite fight, and 99% of the time, you simply click it and move on as they're likely to make some aspect of your build better and at worst do nothing at the time. There's generally no downside to picking them up, and you really aren't required to make a choice. Now at shops, you're actually given many choices. Now unless you walk in there with like a thousand gold, you have to be a bit more choosy and correctly evaluate which, if any, of the options presented are right for your deck. It might not make sense to buy a relic at all, and you might choose to remove a strike or buy a potion instead. The really difficult choice about relics comes into play after boss fights in Acts 1 and 2. Here, you're given a choice between three different and typically powerful relics from a specific pool of boss relics you can only get from these fights, or if you boss relic swap in the beginning of the game. All these boss relics, unlike the relics you see elsewhere in the Spire, have both upsides and downsides to them, and in the case of Snekowai, for example, can drastically change how your deck works. These relics can increase the scaling of your deck dramatically if you find and choose the right one. Which brings us to number 8, Build and Scaling. The idea of scaling is present all throughout the Spire. Fights get more difficult, each act has a boss at the end of it, and some enemies gain strength or block over the course of a fight, so it's really important your deck scales along with these challenges. Upgrades and relics definitely help with this, but there are other ways your deck can scale as well. Cards that increase one of your stats after you play it are probably your chief source of within-fight scaling. These cards are often powers, but there are skills to help you with this as well. Without cards like these, it can be difficult to match the increasing intensity of fights throughout the game, and typically your deck's going to include at least one such card. Cards like Barricade, Feel No Pain, and Blur work in conjunction with other cards to generate block or keep it across turns, making fights much safer. Cards like Noxious Fumes, Bullseye, or Terror passively deal damage or increase damage dealt to enemies across a fight, helping you do more damage over time. These are just a few examples of cards that increase the effectiveness of your deck across fights, but generally, when you hear the terms scaling block or scaling damage, you're hearing about these kind of cards. We covered how having card draw is incredibly important for any deck, but we haven't talked about energy yet. Adding more energy to the mix to play more cards per turn is effectively scaling for any class you choose. Adding cards and relics that increase both card draw and energy increase your output each turn and hopefully either gets your other scale in place or ends the fight altogether before the enemy scales to a dangerous point. All that said, I can pretty confidently say that being able to draw and play more cards on a turn is probably the most powerful form of scaling you can build into on any given playthrough, and your chief source of energy scaling across a run is likely to be the boss relics that you acquire. Most runs are going to incorporate some of these types of scaling, but ideally all these forms of scaling come together to form truly legendary builds and epic wins. Number 9. Practice the things you don't like. I strongly recommend that you challenge yourself and experiment with things whenever appropriate, especially those things that you're not comfortable with. I don't get to play with Brimstone very often, but when I do, I'm happy about it. If something feels painful or awkward to use, it's likely being used in the wrong way, in the wrong decks, or simply without much practice. For instance, just a short while ago, I never used to consider taking the boss relic swap option from Niao at the start of a run which swaps your class's default relic with a random one from the boss relic pool. It was simply weird and uncomfortable, and I just didn't want to do it. But once I tried it a few times, I learned pretty quickly that by not doing so, I was missing out on so much. Since then, many of my most memorable runs have started with boss relic swaps into much stronger and more interesting starting relics. Runic Dome is a relic that's almost universally disliked in the Spire community. 
But for those that practice with it, know the enemy behavior as well and build around it, it's almost like free energy, and we know how important that is. That said, not being able to see enemy intents can be extremely unpleasant to play with, at least initially. That doesn't make it a suboptimal choice, though. Many times the optimal choice for a deck is the one you don't enjoy as much or the one that isn't necessarily as fun. Basing your choice is less on what you like and more on what works will often get you further up the spire. So if you come across something in the spire that you don't have a lot of experience with or just aren't comfortable with, give yourself room to experiment by grabbing that thing and trying it out. Each time you practice with it, you'll learn a little bit more about how it works, what synergies it sets off, and where it simply doesn't work. This will empower your ability to adapt even more. Some of the more successful Spire Slayers I know have said that this point alone was key to their learning and eventual success. Number 10. Prepare for more immediate challenges. Focus on the near future and build accordingly. Throughout this guide, we've established that there's a ton of things to consider as you begin ascending the Spire, so much that it can be hard to understand where to even begin evaluating things like cards, pathing, and shop choices. Ideally, evaluation of these things begins at floor zero with your blessing for Niao and considers everything up to the heart fight at the end, but that can be overwhelming and the game is simply unpredictable. In my opinion, the best place to start is considering the short term and focusing on the current act. So now my question is, do we go this way and like try to stay the course or are we going around? At any given time in your run, pause for a second and ask yourself, how does my deck do against the elites I haven't seen yet? How does this deck perform against the boss at the end of the act? Does this relic or card that I'm considering improve my odds in those challenges? These questions help you practice the thought process necessary to better evaluate your choices throughout a given run and to begin thinking ahead to future acts when evaluating the same choices. This can be time consuming and sometimes daunting to practice. But if this kind of thing doesn't come naturally to you, like it doesn't for me, then this mental exercise might help you develop the abilities you need to more quickly and accurately evaluate the myriad of choices that you're posed with throughout a run. It certainly helped me. I hope my perspective on how to path, scale up your build, and begin to develop the thought processes necessary to make the right evaluations for your particular run helps you become a more successful Spire Slayer. I definitely have a ways to go in my own abilities, but practicing these things with my community over on twitch.tv slash Beta has helped me improve greatly. You should come check us out sometime, and join the Discord as well in case you miss us live. We'd love to hear from you. Make sure you subscribe to this channel for more guides and awesome heart kills, and don't forget to check out the details of this video to find out how you can get yourself a little Spire swag just by subscribing here and leaving a comment. Thanks for your time, Hope you enjoyed, and good luck in the Spire.